the challenges of mentoring. Successful mentoring doesn't just happen, it's planned. I am Kim Creighton. You can follow, find me on Twitter at Kim Creighton One. Um, I have a podcast called the Community Engineer Report where I talk about inclusion and diversity from a business or economic perspective. I have two events coming up in um, 2018. There's going to be Inclusion Symposium, which are, is for people who are working in inclusion and diversity to come together and network, and it's going to be a retreat, and then I'm doing an inclusion conference. I always put this out here because as a black woman in tech, I have to prove to you that I know what the hell I'm talking about. So um, I'm currently finishing up a master's in training, uh, well, I have a master's in training and development, uh, finishing up my doctor's. Um, I'm, my doctoral study is on successful strategies for increasing organizational knowledge, and I am writing a book, How to Leverage Organizational Culture for Competitive Advantage. That's based on a, po a post that I wrote. So why am I here again? I am a community engineer. I didn't come up with this title. Someone gave me this title. And so this is how I define I believe that everybody should start with a base definition of things so everybody's working on the same page. So for me, community engineering is the intentional and skillful effort of creating environments that support the sharing of common ideas, attitudes, interests, and goals, which result in more productive, diverse, and inclusive communities. So I s explain it as community is the heart, the H-E-A-R-T. Engineering is the operationalizing. How do you turn your mission, your vision, into something that's tangible, that guides who you're, uh, who you're um, uh, supply chain partners are going to be, what customers you're going to have, what customers you're not going to have. All that needs to be defined. So that's what I um, help companies and communities figure out. So this journey started in 2014. In 2014, August, um, my father passed away. And as an only child, that was my greatest fear, dealing with the death of a parent. But when I didn't die, I was like, what's next? So I went away to Hawaii for a week. Yes. I went to Maui for a week, and, um, oh, what was me? And um, as I was um, in Maui, I just, you know, after the snot and the cry and all that stuff, you know, it was just not cute, but it was just needed. Uh, I had this moment, because I'm from education, I had this moment where I said, sent this text back, and I said, I'm leaving education, I'm going into tech, and yes, I use air quotes. Um, I said, I'm going into tech. When I figure out what that is, I'll let you know. I had no clue. Um, and I think that was a very healthy attitude to have because we're making this up as we go. Um, but for the first six months, I was like a kid in the candy store. I was like, whoa, that thing has a name. UX, UI, whoa. And for the first time in my life, being a black female was paying for me in the South. I was getting shit for free all over the place. I was going to conferences. I was getting free stuff. I was like, I'm about to work this, man. I went to my first JavaScript conference and didn't even know what JavaScript was. I was just sitting there because it was a free ticket. And so um, that's just how, you know, this thing was for me. And then it was like, I felt like a superhero. I was like, yes, I'm the only one in the room and people are catering to me. I love this. But then I made a decision. Learn the code, because people kept saying how easy it was. Oh my God, learn the code, it's so easy. It's so easy. <laughs> this is a problem, and we need to stop telling newbies this. This is a lie. And it also devalues what developers or people in tech are doing when you say something is easy. Learning is hard. Learning anything is hard. Learning a new language is almost impossible. I mean, it's just really challenging. So it's caused me to write this blog post, Stop Lying to Newbies, because this is a lie, because this shit's hard. And then I started thinking, uh, again, I'm still investigating, what does this tech thing mean to me? I was that person who would watch the Apple keynote, not just for the products, but to hear why they didn't do something or why they did do something, or if I felt like I needed a um, website for something, because I've always had this entrepreneurial spin, I just pick out a YouTube video and follow the little WordPress website. So I knew I had a more more than consumer interest, but I didn't even understand that I could even be a producer. That was, it had never even crossed my mind. And so what the ongoing mantra is is, oh my God, this is so great, but we can't find anybody. Oh my God, I just can't find any good developers. Oh, oh, uh, it's just I'm so sick of people whining about this. It's like oh. You know, this is great, but we just can't find anybody. And see, there's a challenge. But the challenge is not the number of newbies coming into this field. Because let's, let's be
be honest. I could be a taxidermist today and decide tomorrow I'm going to learn how to develop. And no one's going to say I can't do it. I can figure this out. But there are no traditional, there needs to be a thing that bridges my learning to the community or what it's really like to be in a work environment. Because most of these things are not, they're artificial environments, like most of our education. It's an artificial environment. You always get a win, but that's not how it is in real life. And so the developer community is so overwhelmingly generous. Again, I get a whole bunch of stuff for free. And, um, oh man, this black and beef nail thing is really, ugh, I'm really happy about this. And, um, and, um, but we need to figure this thing out because newbies need your help because everybody keeps saying, you see these, well, I understand a lot of these posts that come out, these job postings are from HR people who really don't understand what the hell developers do, don't even understand this whole process. So they'll say, oh, we, give me, they need to hear that on the, they need to hear that on the tape, thank you. Um, because who asks for five years of SWIFT? What? You know, they're asking for, it's like, well, you need to vet that with somebody who knows what they're talking about. So there's a hard, if the people in the industry who are managing technical people don't understand this, how are newbies going to figure this thing out? And I'm a researcher, and I believe in talking about the numbers. It's costing businesses. If, you, you, if you're in your businesses, you know how much it costs you guys to recruit, train, and, 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 and bring somebody over so that, and get them to a level that they can actually participate or actually be provide any value to, I want to be careful about that because they br bring value in other ways, but providing value to the coal base or whatever the thing there is. And with the fast pace of uncertainty, um, mentoring is a strategy that people are using for organizational knowledge sharing. So my, as I said, my research is or organizational knowledge sharing. You guys think about this. What if that one person who has all your knowledge leaves that company? You SOL. And it happens to a lot of people. Um, and organizational leaders report that ineffective employee mentoring and inadequate knowledge sharing is costing $31.5 billion. And these are just Fortune 500 companies. So it's eating you guys alive. So we're going to talk about uh, the four quadrants of mentoring. Understand the difference between personal and professional and adult and, and, and youth. Because this is what the thing that people get kind of like, oh my god, this mentoring thing. If you're mentoring young people, which I've done, and let me start by saying, I don't like kids. <laughs> and as an educator, I damn sure don't like your kids. <laughs> you guys suck as parents. You need to stop telling your children how special they are, because they're only special to you. Uh, because they walk into my classroom like, oh, no, no, you're not. Let's bring that ego down a bit because you're not. Um, but when I'm mentoring young people, my goal is to make sure they are happy, well, not even happy, <laughs> tax-paying, <laughs> law-abiding citizens. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, a lot of my happy. They, they, they're happy with me five years after the fact. Um, they come on my Facebook, oh, Ms. Creighton, thank you for telling yeah, because I ripped you a new butt, didn't I? I just really, because and when I was an ed ed educator, my goal was I could really honestly could care about the math, science, social studies, and somebody with way better skills could do that for you. What I was doing was helping you prepare for the real world. So I was giving you lessons that was going to kick you square in your butt because your parents were rescuing you every time you did something. You don't have coping skills. You're not critically thinking. You're just a pile of nothing. And it's like, dudes, and I was a high school teacher. And so I was like, oh, 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 oh. And so I was like, I don't even care what people like, when I do inclusion and diversity, people are like, oh, aren't you scared about trolls? I was a high school teacher. <laughs> what can these people say to me? And I'm a certified special needs teacher. I'm good. I have all of this. But so that's the thing when you're dealing with young people. It's about them. It's not about you. It should not be about you. It's about giving them what they need. But on the hand, on the hand, when it's an adult relationship, mentoring is focused on usually something specific. Even though it's very nebulous, it's about a career change, a career goal, advancing professionally, that kind of thing. And it's focused on how I get better at doing these things. And um, interesting, as you know, a mentor can switch. A person can be in the role of a mentor at some point. They could be a role of a mentee, or they could be both. 
It could be two people sitting at a table who one person understands this concept and the other person, and they just go back and forth and they help each other. Personal. Whew. This is what scares people. Because when you're dealing with a personal mentorship relationship, it's personal. And you just can't extricate yourself out of those situations. You can't just say, whew, I see you have suicidal thoughts, but I got a dinner, um, a reservation <laughs> that I'm trying to make. So um, can we put a pin in that for a minute? Can we just put that on the whiteboard there? Um, and so that's where personal mentoring is. And it's, it's all over the place. When I was mentoring young people, I realized that it wasn't just them that I had to mentor. Because exactly when I went home, I was like, damn, I got to mentor these people too. Sheesh. Because the parents, I mean, these kids are getting these babies from their parents, so if I'm doing something I want to be valuable, i got to change these knuckleheads so you don't mess up what I'm doing over here. But professional mentoring is something else. It should be seen, it could be an official, unofficial mentoring program or apprenticeship programs. That's what we need to get back to. We need these apprenticeship programs because we can do well-established goals and objectives. And this is how mentoring is planned. You need to have well-established goals and objectives. So this, we're going to stay in the adult and professional area of this. So let's talk about, first of all, what mentoring is not. Mentoring is not slack. It is not stack overflow. That is, my house is on fire. I need to put it out. So that's why people use stack overflow or um, slack or other these, I'm solving a problem now. That's not what mentoring is. Mentoring is not casual. Um, I remember several times being on Stack Overflow because Atlanta has a community called Tech uh, 404. And I asked a question, and I'm changing my code, I'm going through it, we're working, and all of a sudden the person disappears. I don't know if they dropped dead, they got off work, whatever it is. But you, I've changed my whole code base, and I don't, and it's just all over the place, so I have to start over again. You don't just drop somebody if you're mentoring. You just don't say, oh, time for lunch, got to go. Um, and, it's, and it's not static, it evolves. It's a relationship. So mentoring is a relationship. And I'm not going to assume, I'm going to assume that everybody in here has perfect relationships that they value and care about. I'm just going to make that assumption. And you know if that's what the case, you put time into those relationships. You respect the people who are part of those relationships. If you're going to be late, you call, you text, you say, hey, I'm running late. If you um, don't get something done that is important to that relationship, you actually um, say, hey, I'm not going to, you give them advance order. You just don't show up. This is what um, mentoring is. It's personal. It's a commitment. And it can be professionally, um, developmentally, my, I mean, it's such a shift when someone become, gets mentored. Because what the mentor is doing is providing information to those things that most people, particularly newbies, you don't know what you don't know. You don't even know. If you don't know what you don't know, you don't even know the questions to ask that make sense that you don't even don't know because they're not even there. And so what happens is if I'm working on something, if the mentee is working on something, the mentor can come in and say, oh, this is the thing, this is that thing, and this is how we do it, or this is how you look for it, and that kind of thing. Because you don't even know that you don't even know. And, for, and I'm going to talk about this Stack Overflow thing again. Please be nice to the newbies on Stack Overflow because most people – Get to Stack Overflow, particularly newbies, because everybody says Google it. And what comes up first? Stack Overflow. So they don't know the rules because they can just open, just go into the Stack Overflow is not a closed community where somebody will put, um, will say, uh, these are the rules, this is how we do things. They don't know. If you can't answer the question, just bypass it. No one needs to hear your, just shut up. No one needs that. <laughs> so the factors, um, uh, mentoring. You have to understand the role of a mentor. You should uh, provide vocational support, psychosocial support, and role modeling. Uh, you're the only person who can give, uh, a, and so you need to also evaluate your motivation. And I say this because a bad mentor is worse than having no mentor at all. If you don't like working with people, if you don't have patience, if you don't understand that you have to change how you intake knowledge or information to, um, to have it focus on the persons, how they learn and take. You can't do that. Please stay away from newbies. Find some other way to help. Because learning is difficult enough, and, you, and it, learners are very vulnerable, and you don't want to be that person who shuts somebody down. And I'm going to say it again, because it happens all the time. And you, Some of you don't think it's you, but it's you. 
A bad mentor is worse than having no mentor at all. Um, and also, you are able to, you need to, when you decide this, you have to make an honest assessment of your time, your ta talent, and your temperament. You have to know this. And you, you're the ones who can make set realistic goals, because most mentees say, oh, I want to be a back-end back developer, or they say, I want to go into DevOps. That is huge. But they just come to you like, I want to go into DevOps. Like, it's just one step. And so you're able to help them make uh, set realistic expectations. And men, on the mentee side, there needs to be reciprocity. Somebody's giving up their time, talent, and temperament. You need to be able to be on time, do what they say, um, see if you can help out. Um, uh, also, I say, do not ask for a mentor until you provide value to that community. So often, people are come up to me or DM me and, oh, I want to do, I need a mentor. And I say, what have you done to the community? What have you given? Oh, nothing. Well, why do you expect somebody to give? You need to be able to give to receive. And so these are some other reasons the industry needs to do a better job at recruiting. Um, newbies have a hard, uh, difficult time to level up, as I talked about. Learning the car code is hard. And since there's no uh, career defined, clearly defined career path, I call this the Wild West. Every day we are making this stuff up. This is the only industry, and you could I, I, I challenge people, raise your hand if you know another industry where you don't have to be an expert to get hired and you're allowed to make mistakes. You're paid to make mistakes. People expect you to make mistakes. If you're an if you're, um, attorney or a medical doctor, you're hired as an expert. And if you make mistakes, that's liable. And that's in most industries. So this is a total mind shift for most people, and it's a challenge. It was a big paradigm shift for me. And um, positive men mentoring uh, relationships improve mentees. OK, this is, you can read that yourself. I'm going to just tell you this thing. <laughs> I hear this all the time. Oh, if I bring in a junior, they'll leave after I, um, after I train them. <clears throat> They're not leaving because of that. <laughs> They're leaving probably because your culture sucks. <laughs> because research has shown that once you um, put in and value those relationships, people do not leave. They do not go to better paying jobs because who wants to jump out of the, go, leave, the grass is not always greener. You go for it. There are people who leave for a $10,000 bump. But when I talk to people in marginalized and underrepresented communities, which I am of both, if there's a $70,000 job, because I use $70,000 because I don't know the cost of living here, but $70,000 is a good base job for most because it's a hell of a lot more than I made as a teacher. So if you had two jobs, one was 70 and one was 80. The one at 70 is going to um, provide mentorship, is, is, is a, cl uh, a great culture. Um, they're not, you know, it's not about, so let me tell you this, having a, a pool table and all that is not culture. Um, people feel safe in this environment, but there's one that pays $10,000 more and the work hours suck, the people are toxic. People in marginalized and unrepresented un communities are going to go with the $70,000 $70, job. Because by the time I've gotten the headache of all this other crap, that extra $10,000 means absolutely nothing to me. And you also have to understand that people from marginalized and underrepresented communities have been treated like crap their whole lives you know, in these environments. So why would we go there? I would take, as long as I can pay my bills and have some fun, I'm going to take this one rather than that one. Those are the things you need to think about. My pet peeve, imposter syndrome. You cannot have imposter syndrome if you don't know nothing. <laughs> uh, but imposter syndrome, by definition, is somebody who has the skills who still doubts their ability. These people don't know shit. So they can't, I mean, so if you hear, but everybody wants to be diagnosed with something. So you don't tell a newborn baby, roll over. You have imposter syndrome, roll over. have the jobs that they want already. We're not filling the pipeline quick enough. 
So you need to invest in these juniors so that you have a pipeline field. And then you can, because that, we need to stop thinking just reactionary and in the moment. We always assume causality because of cause and effect. But that's not the case. If you're not working now to fill your pipeline, in five years you won't have people. And you need to think about that. And that's going to affect your business. So I'd like to show this um, survey. So because the common misconceptions are that um, most of these people who are learning to code are, um, you know, they've been doing this since childhood. We know they haven't. A uh, majority of people are just learning. They're just coming out of here learning. Um, and because there's so much free stuff out here, it becomes easy to learn um, until you need to do something with that. Because what you're basically doing, and I'm going to, I'm not a big proponent of boot camps, and if you run a boot camp, oh well. Um, because they don't, most boot camps do not have certified educators writing their curriculums. Most boot camps do not have um, policies and processes in place when somebody gets left behind. When I'm paying $15,000, there is no left behind for me. You better figure this out. Um, boot camps, most of these curriculums are focused on how the person who created the curriculum likes to learn, and that's not how everybody likes to learn. Uh, most people, they don't have, understand learning styles. They don't understand learning theory. So this, these are the things why you need um, people to mentor, because most of these people are coming from informal educations. Uh, most of these people are self-taught. And I don't know how they got to over 100 on all this. I, 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 I've been, my, my percentages, I thought, were 100%. But uh, if this proves the point that 125% people were successful for mentoring, that's what it is. So, but how do you do this? Project-based mentor. You do work on projects all the time. If someone says, hey, I want to go into DevOps, raise your hand. Just shout out what's the first thing you would say they need to know. Who? AWS. So we'll talk about AWS. But we know AWS is huge, right? They're adding stuff seems like overnight. It just, just grows. So what I would do, because that's still too big. Now let's chuck this. We're going to talk about, if you, you need to learn AWS, what's the first thing they need to know with AWS? Deploy AWS. Huh? Deploy AWS. Ooh, that sounds complicated. All right. So, <laughs> so then that's what you focus on. And so what you do is just like learning. It's, it's a... Two steps forward, ten steps back. So you'll talk about that, and then they'll do that. And what's the next step that they need to that can connect those two things? Well, hell, if you don't know, how do you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let me give an example. So let's say um, they want to do uh, 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 front end development, and so we know that front end development is using the HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So what I would do is give them a document with some text in it, mark this up. How would you mark this up in HTML? I'll start there. Then when they've done it, then you come back and you say, hey, why did you use the H tag, the H1 tag here? And have them talk about that, because once they talk about it, they learn that. Then you add, let's say, um, we're going to make this paragraph green. So now you add one, not all of CSS, to this thing. And then you say, OK, so why did you, um, how did you do that? That, that, that? Okay, So now we want you to create um, a button. And then you add that, and, and it's just a button. It's just one thing X. So we move it to the JavaScript part, which is the one button. And then I want you to animate that button or make it click on, click on, pause. Just that one thing. And then so you're connecting these things. So they're not getting the full breath, but they're understanding because they're coming back to you and telling you why these things, wh what they're doing. So I like to um, uh, do a self-assessment. And so quickly. Can somebody tell me three strengths and three, if you're, if you're a mentor, what are three strengths that you have and what are three challenges you have as a mentor? Yes? OK, so that's a challenge. So what is a strength? <laughs> well, no. That's, no? If you don't listen, that means that how, do you, is, how is your strength shutting up? No, I don't. Oh, I'm being heckled. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Yes. Patience. Patience. That's your strength or weakness. And what's your weakness? Weakness? Um, okay. So if you have patience and your uh, weakness is making time, what I would say is put the ownership on them. It's not about you. It's about them. So give them a project. Hey, let's say they want to do, let's give them three options. Go to your research. Pick these three options. Which are the three options you want to start with? 
Then you, in the front end, you give them a list of the things and then they go back and do it. You do not engage with them until they come back with this thing finished. You don't talk about, mm -mm, no, let's, unless they have like questions. Um, and you find a way that works for you. Because in this thing, we have to make sure that it works for the mentor. So it's about um, taking, your, taking your strengths and figuring out how to use them to help your weaknesses. Um, anybody else? Wow, this is a quiet crowd. Sure. Shh. So strength, uh, yes. common sense, I think that's a strength. And for personal challenge, I can't stand stupid people. OK, see, that right there. All right, so your first strength is common sense. That's not measurable. Uh, common is not so common, and the fact that you can't, uh, I, I would, I really would say um, you might want to hold off being a mentor, um, <laughs> for now at least, um, because, until you figure out what's stupid, because what is stupid? What are stupid people? It might be something that just aggravates you, but that's how they learn. So you need, you would, to be an effective mentor, you need to step out of you and think about how does this person learn? How do they take in information? Because then you will see that they're not so stupid. And they're not asking stupid questions. They're asking questions from a, their point of view and their perspective. And that's another reason why we need inclusion and diversity efforts to work in this industry. Because when we have different perspectives at the table, it helps us create better products and services. It helps us develop people better. So when you have someone who's a newbie, because they're going to challenge you on why, because you might be using tools five years old. When they ask you why, you need to be able to tell them why, and it needs to make sense, because they may have an idea that works better. But because you've been using that tool so long, it pushes you out your side, your comfort zone, where we all need to be. So with that, I want to say thank you, and have a great day. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so part of the mentorship and pipeline issue, uh, how much of the issue is just the fact that coding didn't used to be cool? I don't understand. So, like, you have a lot of people who got into it, like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Then you have some newer people, a lot of more people from different backgrounds who are now trying to get into coding and computers because it's cooler, there's more money, you know, things like that. So what's the... How do you bridge the gap from that? I don't see that there is, I don't see that there's a problem with that because let's be honest, the people who got in at 10 and 20, they're old. Um, again, it's about building their pipeline. They have antiquated, they're, they're working on antiquated notions. They're offending people left and right. Um, they, um, we need to get, gain, get them to pass on that um, knowledge. And we respect them for what they've done and who they are, but there is, you can't, this is the issue. Your question sounds, and I hope not to offend you, it sounds very elitist. Because it comes off as why are these people, you know, how are all these people entering? It is a, a viable, very well paid industry and business. And more people need to come into this. Because, again, I left education after seven years making less than when I started. How the hell did that happen? It happens because my salary never went up, but my benefits and everything else went up. So we not need to stop seeing people as newbies, as usurpers, but embrace them because these communities need them. Mentoring is a huge time commitment. Um, it takes a lot of time to spend uh, teaching somebody. Um, how do you, what do you look for when you're choosing the right person to invest that time into? A mentor? I mean, a mentee? A mentee, yes. Again, this is why I tell mentees to make sure they give before they ask because it's a relationship. Who wants a relationship with a bad person? So that's what I look for. I look for somebody who, because they've, they've been in the community and I've watched their behavior and I've seen that kind of thing, I'm like, okay, I want to invest my time in that. Um, also, there needs to be, sometimes you only have, let's say you have a, uh, I have six months before the, I know this big project's coming up. These are the things that I can help you with. You, can, you need to find somebody else with these skills to help you with that thing. So a person should have more than one person working on things. Um, but yeah, you have to, it's mentoring, mentors are a guide, they're not doing the work. And once you, we get that in our heads and we do some time up front to put some things in place, okay, these are the goals, these are how we're going to get there, I'm going to hand this to you, I'm going to check back when you get something, and if you do that and schedule it, so it's not, 
I can't answer your text all during, nope, these are the times that I'm available. And be very clear, because it's easy, it's, a learner would be better by, and this is just honesty, period. Anybody would do better by knowing what your boundaries are up front, then they're doing something, and then all of a sudden, you're not answering because you're overwhelmed, and you don't want to know how to say, I can't do this, and all these other things. Put the things out in front, and be honest. Thank you so much, great talk. And I'm thinking, like you've inspired a room full of people here now, maybe some of them are seniors, want to mentor. Um, if a mentor is just starting and maybe hasn't mentored before, like you gave us so much good advice, like can you pick one or two things that a new mentor should definitely do when they're you know, uh, connecting with a mentee or starting to mentor? Like what should they definitely do? Again, it's about, um, for me it's project-based learning. So it's finding out from them where they want to go. Because that's the first thing, because when you say web development, that is not concrete enough. When you say I want to be going to that, that's not concrete enough. So that tells you right there where you need to start. You need to help them define some kind of goal, some kind of endpoint, because they don't know how to do it. So once you do that, then you backtrack. And then you use project-based learning. You just make it as simple as possible. There's so many resources online for this. It does not have to be complicated. It does not have to. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for them. So you have to also think about, it's not just the, the technical skills. Your role is, are the psychosocial skills and the role modeling. So you need to, they're going to be upset sometimes, and you need to be able to deal with that, and you need to be able to walk the talk and talk, because if they see you doing something that's inappropriate, you're not using the, um, documenting your code, you're not doing all these other things, they're not going to go by what you say. Just like anybody else, they're going to start doing, picking up these bad behaviors. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.